Hi, thank you very, very um, so our next speaker is going to be Adam Bennett Watts and he's be talking about, he will be talking about perfect value three, um, three XR games. Um, thank you very much, please go ahead. All right, uh, let me just make sure, okay, good. Hi everybody, uh, thanks Christian for the nice introduction. And yeah, so this is uh, some work concerning three XR games. It's a joint between myself and uh, William Helton, uh, Bill Helton at UCSD. Um, okay. So here's a here's an overview of the talk. It's also meant to be a bit of a warning because I real uh, a warning and an apology because I realized that this is the you know a talk in the final time slot, and uh, we're going to start off a little a little notation heavy. Um, so so just a heads up about that. Um, uh, it hopefully hopefully you know if you want to follow through the notation you can, and if you want to listen to me while you're cooking dinner, there's still going to be something to get out of it. So. Uh, anyways, yeah, we're going to start with some notation, uh, and then we're going to we can actually run through some of the main results, uh, prove prove one of them, uh, uh, and sort of avoid the more algebraic parts of this result uh, almost entirely. Uh, and then time permitting, we'll give just a couple slides of some of the more algebraic side of what's going on, uh, and then run into open questions. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, let's see how it goes. Um, okay. So this is the talk about non-local games, uh, XOR games, but I think sort of as is customary, any talk like this should start off with this sort of a picture. So what is a non-local game? Well, it's a game played between a verifier, who's this uh, cloud in our case, and some number of players. And I've drawn a game with three players, that's Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And uh, in a round of the game, what this cloud, the verifier does, is he sends a question, a symbol to each of the players. Uh, and I've labeled these questions AI, BI, CI, and the reason for the subscript will become clear soonish. Um, the players, they get their question. Uh, they don't communicate with each other, uh, but they send back some response to the verifier, which I've labeled this X hat, Y hat, Z hat. And then the verifier applies some scoring function that takes into account uh, the questions asked, the response is given, uh, and gives some overall uh, uh, score to, to the player's uh, ability to respond to the questions. Um, so what this setup is doing is it's, uh, is it's testing the, the player's ability to produce certain correlations. Because uh, what happens is the players ahead of time, they know the sets of possible questions that could be asked. They know the scoring function. Um, they can discuss amongst each other a strategy for responding to the questions. But when the game is run, they can't communicate. So during a run of the game, Alice only has partial information. She knows AI, she doesn't know BI or CI, and yet she still has to respond with an X that somehow achieves a high score on the scoring function. Um, so you know, the question is how high a score can the players achieve an expectation? Uh, and that's really just a proxy for asking a question about what sort of uh, correlations the players can produce. Okay, so that's the general non-local game setup. Uh, and then this talk is about XOR games, which is just sort of a restricted type of non-local game, um, where we keep the same, same picture, same framework. But I'm just going to say that these AI, BI, CI, these questions, well, they're just integers. Let's let them range from 1 to n. Uh, these responses, x, y, and z, uh, they're just single bits. They're either 0 or 1. And then the scoring function has a very special form, uh, where we're just going to check uh, the sum of the player's responses. Uh, we're going to sum the player's responses mod two, and we're going to ask if they uh, match some uh, desired parity. You know, either for a given set of questions, we want the responses to have either even or odd parity. So that's what the scoring function does. And if it has the desired parity, we give the players a score of one. If it doesn't, we give them a score of zero. So, so a really simple scoring function, um, but the same framework is just a general non-local game. Okay. So this is the sort of a standard XOR game picture, except for I've put hats in some places and I've put subscripts in some places. Uh, and now I want to give you something that's that's still standard, but maybe not completely standard. And it also is going to explain why these subscripts are there. And that's to say that uh, one sort of important way to think about what an XOR game does is that this XOR game played between the verifier and the players is really a chance for the verifier to test satisfiability of some linear system of equations. So what do I mean by that? Well, here's a linear system of equations. There's m equations. Uh, 
and this is where the notation gets a little hairy. I apologize. You know, this is m equations on three n variables. So the variables are this x sub i, where you know i is an integer ranging from one to n, but that i is labeled by a i or b i or c i. Sorry, I shouldn't have said i twice there, but hopefully you're following. So there's three m variables. You know, x sub something, y sub something, z sub something, where that something ranges from one to n. Okay, so you. Your setup is you're given a system of equations like this. The verifier wants to test whether the system of equations is satisfiable. How does he do that? Well, he picks some equation at random, let's say the ith equation. Uh, and then he sends to each of the players the, the index indexing that variable. So he sends AI to Alice, BI to Bob, CI to Charlie. And then the players respond with the value of the variable that is indexed. So Alice should send back the value of xai, Bob should send back the value of ybi, Charlie should send back the value of zci. And then the verifier just checks that these variables uh, satisfy the clause. Right? He sums them up together and checks whether they equal si like they're supposed to in the system of equations. Um, and we'll make this more formal in, I think, just another slide. But you can sort of start to see that, at least classically, uh, if Alice and Bob and Charlie want to win this game, they need to find uh, variable assignments that satisfy a large fraction of these clauses. Uh, and in particular, you know, if they want to go in the game with value one, they've got to find a variable assignment that satisfies every single one of these clauses in the system of equations. Okay. Um, so that's uh, that's XOR game sort of from a top-down view. That's you know that's what an XOR game looks like. But in this talk, I want to sort of get into the a, a bit into the nitty gritty of now talking about what I'm calling strategies. So the, the techniques that the players actually have for responding uh, to questions and how to describe those, um, both quantumly and classically. So let's start classically. Um, and there, maybe the first thing to note is that in the classical situation, well, what can Alice, Bob, and Charlie do? Let's just think about Alice. She gets sent a question from the verifier and she responds. Uh, with just a single bit, a zero or a one. Um, and now you could think that she might have some randomness involved in her response. You know, maybe she flips a coin after getting the bit to decide whether she sends a zero or sends a one. And that's certainly possible, but uh, it turns out that if you just want to think about sort of optimal strategies, strategies that achieve as high a score as possible, well, a minimax argument tells you that you don't need to do that. So uh, by that argument, we can just sort of restrict away from those and just think about classical strategies that are purely deterministic. OK, so then what's that? Alice gets sent a question. Uh, she responds with a bit. Uh, I can just describe Alice's strategy completely just by giving her response to every possible question. You know, To describe a classical strategy, all I need to do is describe these variables. I'm calling them x, a, y, b, z, c, that you just read as x, a is Alice's response to question a where A now ranges over all the possible questions. Similarly, Y, B, and Z, C. And this completely describes a classical strategy. And so if this completely describes a classical strategy, uh, from it, you should be able to figure out a player's win probability. And well, let's think about a given round. On a given round, everything is deterministic once the questions are set, because the responses are set. And players win on a given round if and only if, well, these variables sum to the desired parity, right? XAI, YBI, ZCI sums to the SI that you want. Um, and it turns out this is really all you need to do. Um, you know, that's, that's the chance they win a given round. If rounds are selected uniformly at random, what's the probability that they win? Well, that's just the, the fraction of clauses that are satisfied by their variable assignment. And then the thing that we actually care about is the value omega. That's the, the maximum win probability that they can achieve. And that's just the maximum fraction of satisfiable clauses in the associated system of equations. So at least classically, when you're thinking about X or games and talking about the value, you're really just talking about the maximum satisfiable fraction of clauses in some system of linear equations. OK, so that's the classical picture. What about the quantum case? Well, um, uh, let me give you two of these. Uh, so in the quantum case, what a you know, what, what can you do? What, what's the additional benefit that you get? 
Well, the point is Alex, Bob, and Charlie, they now know about quantum mechanics. So you have to allow them the possibility to measure some, in, some state before they give their response. Uh, and more than that, we have to give them the possibility to measure a state that might be entangled. Alice and Barbie, Ch Bob and Charlie can't communicate, but there's nothing stopping them from entangling a state before the game begins and making measurements on it. Uh, so to describe that, what you would need to do, to describe that strategy, I need to tell you the, the state that they entangle, and then I need to tell you that the measurements that they make. And now if we're being completely general, you might worry that these measurements uh, they should be, you know, POVMs. We have to use the P whole POVM formalism. But it turns out that sort of analogously to how we can restrict out randomness in the classical case, and the quantum case, you can restrict down from POVMs to just uh, projective measurements. Uh, and then in particular, I can describe Alice, Bob, and Charlie's strategy uh, just by describing the observables, these things that I'm calling strategy observables, X, A, Y, B, Z, C, which you now read as you know, what's the observable, what's the operator measured by Alice, Bob, or Charlie in response to question, you know, A, B, or C. So to describe a quantum strategy, what do I want to do? I want to tell you these strategy observables, and I want to tell you a shared state. And now if that was all I said, I'd actually be giving you too much power. Uh, you know, if I just let you pick any strategy observables you want, any state you wanted, because remember, we had this condition that when the game is running, Alice, Bob, and Charlie can't communicate. And somehow I failed to enforce that. So uh, to put, put that back in, I want to now make some constraints on these x, y's, and z's. In particular, you know, uh, if Alice, Bob, and Charlie can't communicate, then the observables they measure had all better commute with each other. So that's what I've just said here. And then we also know that the observ observables have eigenvalue plus 1 or minus 1, uh, so they should square to the identity. I'm sorry, uh, I said this in slides, but I didn't say this in words. Um, there's just a small sort of notational shift that we do going from classical to quantum, because in the quantum land, it turns out we want to describe everything multiplicatively. So it's a lot better to work instead of responses that are zero or one with responses that are one or minus one. And then, you know, instead of summing them mod two, you can just multiply them all together. Uh, so that's why the eigenvalues here are plus or minus one instead of just eigenvalues zero or one. Okay, um, so quantum strategy is just described by these strategy observables satisfying these relations um, and just shared state psi. And then once you've done that, well, uh, just like in the classical case, you can pull out a win probability. You can do that in the quantum case too. Um, and the way to think about this, I mean, if you want to read it, you can, but um, probably the best sort of take home is that uh, uh, the players win in the quantum case if and only if uh, the product of all of these observables has either a guaranteed one or a minus one outcome, right? They, they want, depending on the value of s, they want the overall parity of their, observe, of their responses to be one or minus one. Uh, so to win with probability one, well, psi had better be either a one or a minus one eigenstate of this collective measurement that the players make, the x measurement times the y measurement times the z measurement. And so that's just what I've written here. Um, and then if you want to, you know, we don't actually need to do that for this talk, but if you want to, you can figure out a, a win probability, you know, if, if it's not an eigenstate, and that's just sort of how close it is to an eigenstate, which is what's given here. Okay, right, uh, and so you can do this. Uh, you can maximize over observables and states to get the entangled value, the largest uh, win probability for quantum players. And now uh, there's a subscript CO here. That's because in this form, you know, if you know about this already, uh, what I've just described here gives you the commuting operator value of the XOR game, uh, as opposed to the tensor product value. If, uh, if you don't care about the distinction between those, uh, this is a bad talk to start caring because they're going to end up coinciding, so it's okay. But if you do care, you can just keep track of the fact that I've given you the commuting operator value here. Um, but anyways, what's the punchline? Why do we care? Well, this entangled value can be larger than the maximum fraction of classically satisfiable states, so satisfiable clauses. So the entangled value can be larger than the, cla than the classical value. And this is sort of the, the reason to care about non-local games, and XOR games in the first place. OK, so that was a long run of background. Um, now we're actually going to start talking about what there's left to prove. And well, the sort of central question then is this, is 
that, that I'm thinking about is this, is how hard is it to compute a game's value? Um, and here, I'm just gonna catch up on time a little bit, sort of a run through of some, some important results about this, both classically and quantumly in a roughly chronological, chronological order. Um, and I guess these are results about two things. The results about how hard it is to compute the value of a game and how complicated the strategy is in the quantum case that achieves that value. Um, and it sort of worked out nicely that, you know, at first we had results about things that were easy. Uh, whether a game has perfect classical value is easy, easy. If it's a two player XOR game, computing the value is easy. Uh, but then things started to get harder. You know, even classically, approximating the value is hard. Um, you know, when you move on to three player XOR games, there's sort of this sense that the strategies can be a lot more complicated uh, in the with three player case than in the two player case. Uh, and then, you know, this isn't a result about XOR games anymore, but, you know, we were talking sort of debating about NP hard versus easy, I mean, polynomial time here. And then this result comes along and says that, all right, well, for linear systems games, which is another way of testing this satisfiability of a system of equations, whether or not there exists a perfect commuting operator strategy, that's just completely undecidable. Okay, so now, now the complexity is, is wide open, right? Some things are polynomial time, some things are undecidable, and the strategies to go along with some of those things are really, really complex. Uh, this here is just, you know, one consequence of this really nice MIP star equals RE result is that uh, there are some games where, you know, you really need commuting operator strategies, which is to say both infinite dimensional, very complicated strategies to achieve the optimal value. Okay, so, so what am I trying to say here? Just that there's a sort of range of difficulty in computing the value of a game. Uh, and, you know, in general, it's a scary world out there. Uh, the value of a game can be very hard to compute. The strategy can be can be very complicated. And then, okay, this result that I want to tell you about is maybe one you know one small island where things are still nice, which is to say that you have a three XOR game, and you just care about whether or not the question of whether or not the game is perfect, which is to say whether or not the game has value exactly one. Well, that's a question you can answer in polynomial time. And more than that, uh, you can answer it in polynomial time, and the strategies that the quantum players use. Are, are very simple strategies. Their strategy is just on a small three qubit GHG state as opposed to something much more complicated. Okay, so, so this is where we're going. Uh, and now we can actually start, start getting there. Um, so that's the result I wanna prove. How am I gonna prove it? Well, um, the first thing that I wanna do is sort of translate all of this uh, strategy formalism that we had a few slides ago uh, from sort of matrix formalism to, to group formalism and just sort of abstract abstract away as much as we can and be just translate our problem to translate as much information as we can to, to group theoretic information. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing that I want to define is this thing that I'm calling the, the game group. Um, and there's sort of in words and in math, the definition. Uh, if you don't want to deal with that, what you can think of is just we have these observables that the players measure, you know, these x's, y's, and z's. And I can make a group out of them, right? Just take any products of these observables, take the inverse of these observables, and that generates a group. And that group is exactly the game group, except for the fact that uh, in these clauses, we also have a minus one floating around, right? Some, some, sometimes we want the product of these observables to be one, sometimes minus one. I want to keep track of that. So I also want a minus one element in a group, but groups don't have natural minus ones. So I'm just gonna stick one more formal variable into this group, this game group. And it's a formal variable sigma that's really just a proxy for minus one. So, so you know, the only reason I don't say minus one is because there is no minus one in a group, uh, but I'm just calling minus one sigma. So, so what is my game group? It's just products of my observables uh, and then minus one, but instead of minus one, it's a sigma. Okay. so so. You know, maybe I haven't done much, but I've at least defined something. I've, I've, I've noted that my observables form a group. Now here's sort of the next important observation is that I wanna now say something about the clauses uh, of my game, right? This is just all my observables. So I'm gonna define this thing called the clause group. Uh, and again, there's the math, but in words, what am I doing? Remember that I said that if the game has value one, uh, psi has to be in the one eigenstate of some products of, of observables uh, or the minus one eigenstate of some products of observables. 
And another way of saying that is that there's, if the game has value one, there's got to be products of, observ products of observables which fix psi. Um, and those products of observables that fix psi, they also form a group, right? If, if x fixes psi and y fixes psi, then x, y acting on psi had also give you, better give you back psi. Um, so there's this group, the clause group, which is a subgroup of the game group, which is just the subgroup made up of all the observables that fix psi. Um, so, you know, again, there it is in math, but just in words, we have the game group, which is all the product of all the observables, and we have the clause group, which is the subgroup of all the observables that fix psi if the game has value one. And there it is right there. That's sort of our key takeaway. Okay. Um, now I'm running low on time, but I'll, I'll get through this in a little bit more. Um, so what has that done for us, defining this game group and this cause group? Well, we've already gotten to one of, one of the main results. Uh, and there it is again in math. Um, there it is in words. It's to say that if I want to decide if a game has value one, uh, a, an equivalent thing that I can try and decide is I can define this game group, I can define this clause group, and I can ask just a purely group theoretic question, which is say, is sigma, is my, this element keeping track of minus one, is it an H? Uh, if sigma is an H, the game does not have value one. If sigma is not an H, the game has value one. Okay, um, and let me try and explain that statement for you. Um, uh, you know, I, I claim that actually the proof, at least in one direction, is uh, is very natural, just given what we've said. Um, so let me go through it. I uh, remember H is the subgroup of operators of observables that have to fix psi, uh, and sigma is minus one. So if you just translate that directly, you know, the statement sigma is an H, that's equivalent to saying that minus one has to fix psi, uh, which gives us a contradiction. So if sigma is an H and the game has value one, well then minus one fixes psi and that's a contradiction. And, and that's just it. Um, the other direction, uh, it's you know, a bit of work, but it's, it's just representation theory. And you take these groups and you just construct out of them these observables that you want. So, okay. Uh, so that's actually the first big result and maybe the only one that I'll get to talk to in detail. Uh, and it's just saying that it's taking this problem about deciding if a game has value one and turning it into this group theoretic problem about solving an instance of the subgroup membership problem. Okay, and now has that bought us anything? Well, no, because in general, the subgroup membership problem is undecidable for this group. Um, but, you know, we care about a special case of it. Uh, we're asking the subgroup membership problem with this sigma and this H, they have a lot of stru structure. Um, so we're asking about a special case of an undecidable problem. Uh, and we wanna know, is this special case decidable, right? And a priori, uh, you might not know. Uh, for two players, you know, we already knew that the answer was yes, because Cyrilson, we knew that two player extra games were easy. Uh, for three players, uh, this result shows that the answer is yes. And for more than three players now, just jumping into the open questions, this result is completely open. Okay, uh, so this might be my final slide. But now let me just tell you about sort of the key idea in solving the three-player case, um, which is we had this problem that was undecidable, right? The, sub, the subgroup membership problem on G. Um, but here's, a, here's an idea, is that instead of trying to solve the subgroup, some group membership problem on G, um, let's add additional structure to G. Let's pick some normal subgroup of G and mod out by it, and then ask the subgroup membership problem. Okay, um, and let me just say that uh, what this, there's a sort of a group theoretic way to think about this, which is just I'm forcing additional things to equal the identity. Uh, and so what that means is that once I've added this additional restriction that product, other things have to equal identity, I, I've made a weaker condition. You know, I, I'm, so instead of asking if sigma is an H, I'm asking if sigma is an H mod K and um, that's implied by sigma being an H. Sort of, I'm asking, yeah, a weaker version of the subgroup membership problem. But the better way to think about it, I think, is that I'm asking, I'm adding additional relations to these observables. I'm taking these observables in my, uh, for these XOR games, these Xs, these Ys, and these Zs, that have to satisfy some relations. And I'm just going to 
add some additional relations that I asked force these things to satisfy, uh, which is encoded by this group K. And then I'm asking the subgroup membership problem of observables that satisfy this additional relation. Um, and so what I'm asking really is, is there a way to win the game with value one with observables satisfying this extra structure? Um, and so that, you know, that makes the problem easier, but it's not clear in general that it actually answers the problem you know, you're, you're asking a different question. Instead of saying, does the game have value one? You're saying, does the game have value one where there's a strategy satisfying this additional constraint? Um, and for three XOR games, I'll just say that there's ends up being a nice choice of subgroup that you mod out by that gives you an additional constraint to the strategy uh, that, that when you work with, you can, you can check whether the game is satisfied. Um, but let me, I think this is actually a pretty nice place to stop. Uh, but just to finish the proof, then you'd mod out by this k. You pick a nice k. You'd mod out by that, and show that working with this k is equivalent to the original problem. But let me stop here because I think I have to take questions, and maybe I can say more in the in the session later. Thanks. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, so. Please, people, uh, if you if you want to join, you can join in the in the Slack chat uh, session and ask questions there. Um, maybe I have maybe one question, which is um, so based on maybe building center uh, some addition, Could you think of other games where you would believe that that strategy would apply to to solve that decision problem? Is there something particular to that 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 the three X or that you exploited for that to work in that setting, or is is there something that you could could think would actually where that decision problem becomes easy again? Yeah, yeah. So base. So I, I mean I think there's sort of a there there's an art to so the, the, I guess this general idea of K modding always works in the sense that you're asking uh, is there a is there a way you know to achieve value one with restricted observables. You know, I, I apply some additional constraint to my observables. I say, does the game achieve value one? So that's something that I can always do. Um, and I think you know you could you could do that generally for a game, which is interesting. It's sort of a, a nice streak of luck that for three XOR games, there ends up being a nice group K that you mod out by that uh, that gives you an if and only if. You know, if there's a value one strategy, there's a value one strategy after you mod out by this K. Um, so I, I guess. You know, I think I, I suspect the strategy could work for other games, but it would be a different subgroup K, and and picking the right thing to mod out by, picking the right additional re re restriction to put on your observables, is uh, you know, it's it's not clear necessarily what the right restriction is. Um, so the the general framework could work, but there's still a lot of uh, flexibility in what in what group you mod out by, I guess. Okay, I see. Then one question uh, that uh, um, Hong Hao is, is asking, is there a way to reduce a, a 4XOR game to a 3XOR game? Yeah, yeah, great. Um, uh, likely, no, in general. Um, and the reason I say that is because uh, these techniques that work for 3XOR games, uh, I shouldn't actually say we know they broke for 4XOR games. We know they break for 6XOR games. So uh, the the exact results for three XOR games aren't going to carry over to four XOR games and above. Um, you know, there, but how much the complexity grows going from three to four, uh, I have no idea. You know, it could, it could be sort of like I said that you just change this group K that you mod out by by a little bit and everything works, or it could be that things suddenly jump up to being undecidable. Cool. Thanks. Then uh, one more question is uh, by, by Benjamin Lovitz. Uh, so do you expect that the NG, uh, N qubit GHZ state to be the most useful one for N XOR games? That's what he wants to know. Yeah, great question. Uh, I don't even want to conjecture there, I think. Um, uh, uh, let, me, let me say, if I, if I had to guess, I would say no, but I'm not sure. Um, it's sort of, it, it again goes into the details of the subgroup K that you mod out by, but if it was the same subgroup K that you could mod out by for four player games and five player games and so on, you'd arrive at an n qubit GHC state. Uh, and we know that you have to mod out by something else for more players, which suggests that the strategies might be more complicated, um, but doesn't, doesn't 
prove anything one way or another. Okay, cool. Thank you very, very much. It was a very nice talk and um, awesome.